Let her in and let her on your lap, goddammit. Lords and ladies, good wives and good men, I welcome you to the Basset with King's Grave podcast with another episode of Blackfire Backchat, continuing with our House of the Dragon Season 2 coverage. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 5, Regents. Now, as we've all grown accustomed to, there's always matters to address before the council, um, and this one is a dire one. I fear war is to be made upon us and I must assure all my counselors are ready for what may befall us from these rubble. As such, I am raising you all to lords of my war council, and will be effective immediately I name thee, my lord's hand, Hannah. Oh, I humbly accept your grace, and uh, how's it going? It's Wing Shot on forms. My grand maester, Bina. It is my honor to serve you, sire. Hi, everyone. Being a 007 here. My master laws stuff. I humbly accept your grace. My master whispers will be L, who is conveniently not here, and that is good. She is working dutifully. And then after that, my master ships will be Noah. My life and my ball is yours. Your grace. My master of coin shall be David, who is off in Essos for us. And finally, my lord commander of my king's guard, Michael. Hey, Kalwadegi, I swear not to just think with my penis like some other lord commander. And then with that, I am the lord baron. Now, in this week's episode, what do we give it? I think I'm going to give it maybe a 3.5, 4 out of 5 lemon cake. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. There's a couple of things in it that I was like, oh, that's really good. That's, you know, good details and stuff. But um, it felt like another filler, and it seems to be a, like kind of a trend. They do like one really powerful, one kind of filler, one really powerful, one kind of filler. Then how many is this supposed to go to? Eight. 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 Yeah, we're running out of time. I also would give this a three out of five. It also felt like filler. I've had enough of Damon derping around in his ayahuasca dream in Harren Hall. And um, I've noticed that dragon cast seems to pour scorn on people like me who get bored. And they refer to us as NBRs, non-book readers, which I guess I qualify as because I've forgotten the books. But I think we were allowed to feel bored. I don't need, like, Rick's rest every episode, but this one just felt very, very sloopy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd give it a 3.5 out of 5 for similar criticisms made. You can really feel the, the momentum immediately just drops off after Rook's rest, and they really don't have anything to fill in the blanks elegantly. So we're stuck just waiting. Some very good scenes, uh, some standout scenes actually, but I'm lulled and waiting for something big to happen. Um, I'll give it a 3.25 or 3.5. Yeah, I'm, it's, I wasn't bored watching the episode, but I am beginning to tire of the gender essentialism tied to the show's thesis statement. and some characters around that are beginning to feel flanderized as a result but there was some stuff i like too so well said steph yeah i agree i'd go three and a half um definitely with you on the the odd even thing so it was the best odd episode i'd say but still yeah three and a half All right, unlike Rhaenyra, it seems I've chosen my counselors well. 
Um, so we open this episode up on Driftmark with a grieving sea snake at high tide and Rhaenyra overlooking from Dragonstone. Which is a nice little detail because I actually forget how close those islands are. Um, any big thoughts on that opening? I liked the musical score, which was the variant of House Valerian's theme. It was just very mournful. Ramen Jowdy just doing another great job of, of sh- conveying emotions through song. It was very emotional. It was definitely a clutch your partner moment. I thought Corliss, uh, yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant little few seconds of acting from him. And then across the bay, um, we're in King's Landing where we see some rotten fruit and some measly bowls of brown. Is the cat that bad? No, no, we love the cat. Just let her in, though. She wants to meet with you. Enhancing the quality. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we just let her in. Do you not remember yeah. the kitten has three heads? Come on now. Let her in <laughs> and let her on your lap, goddammit. Yeah, that's Vio <laughs> Cannon right there. For fuck's sake. All right. Contin- I'd rather listen we'll to continue. your cat than watch this episode again. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> it wasn't that See, bad. See, if you let her in and she um, gets in your lap, she might purr in the background, and that's even better than her meowing. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, this whole opener to me, I guess they they got to be saving their budget for a uh, four Kings Landing. I really do think we're gonna have that sack before the end is out here with this season, um, or at least the beginning of it. I just have to imagine how how are they gonna drag any of this out for another three episodes without another major beat. But I would have kind of liked to see maybe the aftermath of Rook's Rest, like. I don't know. It it felt uh, n- not as monumental, like monumental as it should have been. This basically coup that Amond has done, and the mourning for Rainey's like wasn't really there. So I don't know. It didn't do it for me, <laughs> but. Um, is this where I can do my Kristen Cole is a fucktard rant? Yes, please. I mean, he has the worst grasp of political optics since Rishi Sunak, our former prime minister, announced the election in pouring rain with some larrikin blasting out things can only get better on the stereo. I mean, you've just been in a battle. You're going to parade half a dead dragon through the streets where people are poor and pissed off anyway. And you don't think this looks like weakness. You don't think this is problematic in optics. The man has the political sense of our former prime minister and it's just tragic to see. And the fact that no one seems to clock to this, that Alison doesn't clock, like he gets how wise Otto Hightower was as a hand. And I think she actually appreciates and gets how wise Viserys was in his way. Why does she not see that this person, questionable whether he's helpful militarily, but he is not helpful politically? End of rant. Welcome to my TED Talk. You're here. See, I think we've, shown, we've seen enough of the previous two battles to see, right? We've seen the purely conventional Blackwoods and the Brackens in, was it 103? Uh, and then the big spectacle during the Battle of Rook's Rest of watching that suit of armor filled with ash that used to be a person. And, you know, people getting crushed by Vagar's claws and boom, boom, boom. So I think I think I'm okay with not seeing the full or yet another like full like aftermath battlefield shot I think seeing a seeing a crippled sunfire might have gone a a, a good distance to appeasing the fans um because mm. obviously you know we've lost Rainice and um she was fantastic 
Yeah, it was more the lack of deference for her than anything else, I think, that kind of bugged me. Yeah, but this is literally what they do in the book. Yeah. Having just said that, maybe, I mean, obviously we're getting ahead of ourselves, but um, they sort of allude to Sunfire dying, so maybe they want to keep a bit of that mystery. Um, so we just get grumpy crispy <laughs> instead. Well, and you're right, Steph. I mean, it's not, I mean, she, it's a footnote in the book, yeah, too. But um, I think if the show has proven one thing, it's not exactly the book either. So why? I know, I, I know. But but again, I, I really must be saving the budget, the effects budget, the, you know, the VFX budget for later. And that's fine if that's the case. I, you know, which one do I need more? I need a strong, you know, overthrowing you know and and taking of king's landing i think that that will be more worth it so yeah i think what they uh i mean but look from team green's perspective rainy's is a traitor you know the the like they had they gave her or allison gave her what allison when she said no (laughs) and then in the show verse she burst through the dragon pit and didn't take her shot when she had the chance, you know, like <laughs> it's um the you know like but that's also just great. Like, she yeah, served the realm. But, yeah, but you know, like Team Green don't see it that way because they think, you know, like as you know, people in these situations often do that. You know, like the realm is like the person of the king, right? So they and also you know like who would have like gotten her been there to like treat her body respective respectfully because like once Re- Melis fell through the walls of the castle they rushed in and then executed every member of the Staunton garrison well i think kind of what i what i w- was thinking is to to show that maybe there is there is no body left and uh or they can't find one and sort of the shock and awe of that maybe like yeah, I don't know, an explanation of why why are we not mourning her, especially when they've done, so they, they've gone out of their way to do these, like, uh, sh- side-by-side shots all this whole time. The one, there was really an on-the-nose one in this episode with Damon and uh, Rhaenyra. So I think to, to more tell the story of that side-by-side with them parting in, you know, Aegon and dealing with his what's left of his corporeal form um with maybe some side by side of what what isn't left with with rainies would have been would have t- kicked me in the feels a little more like like noah said you know hold your partner kind of thing i think it would have worked, but you know it's their show they can do whatever they want with it All right, so yeah, since we're already there, um, Melee's head is carted through the street. Um, it puts the small folk at unease, taking it for a bad omen. Sir Gwen calls it a strange victory. Hugh Hammer calls the dragons just meat after a peasant exclaimed that he thought they were gods. Um, and kind of to your point, Hannah, I do think it almost seems like the writers are kind of hedging their best bets with the audience because it almost seems like these King's Landing scenes are somewhat skewed from the green point of view so in this case you know rather than having grief and mourning like we got with the first two shots this is almost kind of how the small folk feel like you're supposed to be like oh, this doesn't feel right though mm-hmm. yeah true i enjoyed the foreshadowing uh of all this it was it was good. It was one of those, you know, the book reader a nod to the book readers, I guess. But um, perhaps, yeah, and maybe that's what they are trying to say. Which, yeah, I'm prove down it, with like you me. said, proving to the small folk that they're not gods or invincible. So yeah, quite a dumb move. First, uh, is Melee's the first dragon that's been killed since uh, Maraxes? Yeah. Quicksilver was killed by Balerion. 
if you count uh, Sunfire, though, too. Kind of Sunfire ain't is. dead. Sunfire's alive. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> they can say long in the dying all they want. We, we know that's just a tease. Is this is this uh what is it? What is the guy's name? J P- Jacobs, Preston Jacobs. Is this one of his theories? I'll just say I'll eat my hat if Sunfire is not revealed to be alive and all of their language was just a misdirect. Like anyway, that's all I have to say. And then part of that procession, um, we also had um, Egan, and he was brought into and through the Red Keep to the King's Fen Chambers, where the Maesters promptly got to work. Um, we get an awesome shot of Blackfire the Sword, our very own namesake. Um, and then the Grand Maester says the King is with us for the moment as he cuts the armor away from his flesh. Amon says that somebody must rule in his stead. I found it quite cheap the way they did the suspense of, are they carrying a corpse? Is he alive? And then Alison has to say, well, you know, I was just like, oh man. Agreed. This, this just feels cheap. Especially because they put them in like a wild animal container. Yeah, that litter wasn't very, wasn't very much, wasn't very fit for a king now, was it? <laughs> I'm assuming that it was to smuggle him in and not make a big scene of the fact that the king had fallen, like it was deliberately not a king's litter, but yeah. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, they had it covered with that, like, sack, right? They even credited Aegon for um, the kill of Melis and Rhaenys. Well, that's at least politically savvy. And then from there we go to Alicent finding Kristen Cole cleaning his sword. And when she asks about how Eamon fought, he doesn't reply. And then when she asks what his part in this is, Kristen says he cannot say. Any uh, any thoughts on that one? Short little scene. Not a thought, but a question, because I have totally forgotten the books. Um, is it ambiguous in the books whether his brother did him in or... Are we meant to think, yeah, for sure, this guy did him in with a knife just to make doubly sure he wouldn't survive? I don't think there was any ambiguity in the books. It was treated as they all, the dragons all engaged at the same time, and Sunfire and Aegon just happened to get the worst of it. Classic George. Yeah. I quite, I quite liked that. They did that, and um, maybe this is just me being a total dum dum. But I, I didn't pick up on Aemon roasting him in the uh, in the book, so it was it was a a really good change, I thought. But is in this scene, are we seeing is Aemon is is crispy in Aemon's pocket? Is he just totally loyal to him? Is this why he's not throwing him under the bus? I think Christy he's just, just afraid of what Eamon's going to do to him. Yeah, he's just, he's got that thousand yard stare this entire episode. I mean, he's loyal to Rhaenyra not getting the crown. Does he really give a shit if it's Aemon or Aegon? And if someone's just toasted their brother with a dragon, you probably don't want to piss him off. But I think it's more that he's more against someone getting the crown than for another person, if you get what I Right, because he does even say that Aemond is next in line, so it's only right. Yeah, and he's, uh, for as far as Aegon crashing the battle last episode, you know, he was rolling with it for the sake of morale, but uh, he doesn't really seem to have much of an opinion on Aegon personally, whereas, you know, Aemond, he trained and yeah he caught him trying to kill his brother but like what are you gonna do against that if you if you don't let it go he's going to feed you to vagar so well like could he really say about at least the initial battle like up in the air would he have had a line of sight on knowing that part so all he did was find aemond 
over the body with his sword out. And that is a little revealing, but like, what are you going to say about it? I mean, at this point, he can only stir the pot, you know? So it's like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't have said anything either. And what does she want to hear that? She wouldn't be asking if she didn't already know, right? A little bit. Mm -hmm. He's, he, I don't he's think scared. Any better for it now, now, right? I mean, if he's smart, but we know he's not. Um, really quick, I don't <laughs> want to derail this, but Michael, I was super confused by what you're saying about Sunfire <laughs> because I forgot. Yeah, the, uh, Sunfire is only crippled after Rook's rest and then is killed later, and I completely forgot that. But I looked it up really quick in the world book, and you're right. Yeah, some rather important thing to do in the future. So that's why I'm pretty certain he ain't going anywhere, and you're not rendering that beautiful golden dragon model if it's just for one episode. But we will Once see. again, spoilers for books that have been out for many, many, many years. <laughs> like... Oh, yeah, yeah you're right. The only thing we don't spoil here is the Game of Thrones show. Um, but looks like my master of coin is here. Hi. Whoop, whoop. Hello, hello. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going in and out here. One second. Are you hearing me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I think I lost you for a second. I just wanted to deal with to get my phone. Um, sorry. I, I fell asleep watching videos after my alarm went off. <laughs> I just woke up. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Happens to us all. How many lemon yeah. cakes for this episode, David? We were all in the um, kind of three, three and a half. Yeah, kind of that's, yeah, that's about where I am. About three and a half, probably. I think I gave it a three in the poll on the on YouTube. But yeah, I'd say about three to three and a half myself. It feels like after last week, it's just kind of a another like, oh, let's have lots of set up for the for what else is going to happen like i liked it it was good i mean i like it i love this world i love the world building and all that that's going on i i feel like you know the masses are going to be like oh they're talking again <laughs> and after last week like i guess you probably need this but i don't know it was i mean i still liked it but it wasn't like the best they've done <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot because in Game of Thrones, you did have the epic battle episodes, didn't you? Right. Typically, mm -hmm. episode nine or whatever. It just felt they handled the come down more elegantly, like it wasn't as right. jarring. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, I mean, Mikhail could probably tell us with all her sort of screenwriting skill why it is or isn't working, but it does feel kind of jankier than it did in Game of Thrones. I mean, they did have a lot more to work with, though. And episode tens were usually pretty big too. Season finales were usually pretty big there. So even af after the big episode, maybe they should have waited to do the big battle until you know the second to last episode. I don't know. <laughs> well, in the original show, you're following several plot lines, right? If, yeah. Right. That's what if you're say. not feeling, if you're not feeling what Jamie's doing, then you know maybe what Arya is doing or what Sansa's doing will be more to your taste. Right. So it's, and it's not politics. It's not, and it's not all singularly focused, you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's probably why, in the end, they, they had so many threads they could pull out to bring Spice back into it. But uh, Right. It, uh, arguably, this is a more difficult story to tell, you know? Yes, and lacking the written chapters by George itself, with George's very excellent dialogue, probably also leaves them exposed in the sense that they have to come up with this themselves, and not everything is going to be a winner. Yeah, they have to use their own gap filler um, with, you know, like you said, yeah, not everyone is the, the wordsmith that George is, so... Right. They do ayahuasca trips and things instead. So let's fill it with dreams of fucking your mother. <laughs> Great. That sounds like a winner. <laughs> I really needed to see that, actually. Right? My, this whole time, what, all I've been waiting for is... <laughs> like, we had not had enough incest on these shows. Let's throw mom in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
It's like John Oliver's community. They really get the incest right. <laughs> and using that as a perfect transition to boring, poorly written politics. Um, yep. <laughs> in this next scene, Rainier's counselors grow bolder in their sessions, not happy with how things are going. Um, and she begs him, what would you have me do? Meanwhile, Jace is leaving for the twins, and Bela asks, uh, and he asks Bela not to tell his mother until he is away. Any big thoughts on these couple scenes? I'm still frustrated by how uh, disrespectful these counselors are, and that is right. the point of the scene, but it goes in a way that strains the credibility. I'm reminded of uh, many years ago when Ashley made a complaint on a podcast of Ice and Fire that there wasn't enough bowing in Game of Thrones, and um, mm -hmm. the, the sentiment is the same. You can't talk in such a disrespectful manner to your sovereign. It, yeah. It's very on the nose. There's no subtlety here. It, it really annoys me. You know, that probably has to do more with costuming than anything would be my guess. Uh, the lack of bowing, but Steph, I really want you to take it away here because in your yeah. lemon cakes, you kind of you hit the nail on the head in a poignant way, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it just uh, it's it's starting to like it just feels like a lot of flanderization, and also how much of these council scenes are actually like. You know, like, okay, maybe you cannot speak so disrespectfully to your sovereign, but with the general point of Rhaenyra's counselors holding her accountable for her lack of, or her desire to not make any rash decisions when, you know, say, Lord Staunton's castle is under attack. You know, like, they, they needed reinforcements, you know, like, who else was on the mainland was her uh, uh, like immediate ally. You know, like, if you don't protect your vassals, they'll find someone else. So, I don't, it just, it seems odd she that... Just, she just joined the Faith of the Seven and fucked off in secret to King's Landing for an episode. Like, right. <laughs> right. And then just, like, there are people, like, they played that entire, like, councils, right, her returning from the Sister Act scene, like, it was the natural course of action to like fuck off for two weeks without having instructions on how to, and that that's something that makes her, uh, you know, a judicious ruler who wants to avoid war. It's like, okay, even if you like, you felt you really had to do this, you would at least delegate a little bit. Right. Yeah. Well, and even the, like the, the they're really hammering at home, even with the conflict between her and Jace. You know, and all I can think is uh, they're allowing Rainier to sort of seem vulnerable to the audience so that when she does drop the hammer, she'll look even more badass. Sort of like Rini's sitting silently in the shadows and outskirts for all of season one until she like busted through, you know, the, the roof there. That was that was really great, you know? It's like, oh, shit, we didn't know she had it in her. I mean, we did, the book readers did, but I can see where the shock and awe will be later. If we were giving her and the writers the benefit of the doubt, is it not that a lot of her narrative and her dialogue in this season has been around trying to be the queen that her father wanted her to be, a peacetime queen, a queen who is conciliatory, who delivers her people peace? She seems very imprisoned in, maybe because her father showed such faith in her and was so bold in naming her and sticking to her as heir despite her being female, that she seems to me like very much having to refer to that. It's going to take a lot to make her go to war, and that's why they're investing so much in this. I actually find this quite convincing, but that may be just me. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, and she did have like... The one line I liked a lot in there is like, you know, you haven't seen any more battle than I have. <laughs> that was pretty right. good. Which is mm -hmm. a fair point. Which is a fair point. <laughs> right. It's like, did you go with Damon to the step zones? I think not. 
but the um it's uh there's also also in other scenes too it's uh, it, it it yeah i i i see where you're coming from bina and i think that is the intention of the writers and uh you know but how this is and also how this plays into the dagger talk but um the uh it's it's it it just feels very one note when you take this together with what's going on with Damon and uh uh yeah yeah and that yeah, may be the the, the floor and oh sorry oh nothing sorry I just said yeah we've definitely seen this scene before but to your point Bina I think Viserys had more competency around him and hence the success and yeah Viserys was very much like the Phil Foden who was flattered when he plays at league because he's surrounded by great other players and a great manager so he he, he looks better than he probably is I, I concede that um I think I was just gonna like double down on what you're saying now and saying that maybe this is why those talky episodes feel like so much wading through molasses because they're making a point the same point in the Allison scenes as in the Renera scenes that they've made yeah. episode out like we get it we get it that this is a patriarchy and women aren't listening right. to you. I yeah. think we got it by now I think we can move right. forward <laughs> unless you're going to do something cool like they did a very cool kind of audio design and sound design around when Allison had that moment of like ironic revelation in her small council scene but yeah just to have another one does feel a tad tedious i agree well let's also examine this yeah. right so comparing this to the got series for the first four or five years arguably they're doing a a dense book a season in 10 episodes per season and this is one really dense book but still it's just one book that they're dragging out for what are they picked up for four now and it's only part so, of the book <laughs> or do you know what I mean? it's like eh, yeah that probably, that probably see where there are some scene issues because of that the choice comes down to where you focus uh, your attention, like, do we need to focus on more of these scenes? There are there are very well done scenes in this episode that I wish got more focus, but I, it just it just feels yeah repetitive for no no reason. I do wonder if right. the showrunners have a little bit, or the showrunners fallen in love a little bit with the quality of these two actresses, and therefore is leaning into their scenes more. Um, and rather than, I mean, like, you know, sort of, if you look at the established actors who were popular last season, so Damon and these two, two actresses, they're being given a lot of derping around a lot of repetitive scenes. And yet some of the emerging fan favorites, such as Baylor, who is turning into such a badass, and we don't, we don't seem to spend enough time with her. We could have actually had more time with Corliss at the start in the morning of Renice, right? So I feel I that agree. maybe, may, not fan service because there's only one season old, but maybe there's just a little bit of, we want to give the actors we know a good more, and actually it's, it's, it's unbalancing the episodes. Yeah, and I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but like to Michael's point, there there are other scenes that I would have liked to spend more time with or even a larger montage. You know, we go from the Bracken and Blackwood business but the Erie. And you know, like I would have liked to see more of that that ripple out effect of how are the Lords responding? What are the games that they're they're playing? The I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, what are their demands? And um, I, I found those to be more fascinating than anything going on around these council tables this episode. It's difficult, though. They try not to uh, throw so many names at the the non, the unsullied viewer. Like, I've, I've, my wife has definitely had difficulty kind of, you know, bouncing around to 15 different houses in the space of a few minutes, so... I kind of get the choice, but I'm I'm with you. Like I would have, Baylor is absolutely awesome. It would have been great to get a bit more, 
time with her. I mean, look, if they're rushing taking King's Landing, then, you know, like, that might leave us with more time with her to be in the spotlight in King's Landing. completely agree with giving Corliss more more time in the beginning, a little more deference for the loss of Rini's would have been nice, you know, and could have been more hearty filler if we're going to fill something, you know, to me anyway. But The funny thing is I'm going to completely contradict myself now. They have done <laughs> stuff like expanding characters like Egon, amazing actor. And I think George R. R. Martin came out this week and said, They've done things with opening up the motivations of him and making him more than a pantomime villain, and it's really admirable. So they have taken chances on some of those character, you know, expansions or whatever you want to call it. Well, I don't think that's a contradiction at all. I think that's just a, a, a point, again, to what you're saying, you know, spending a little more time with Bailey. Even at this point, Jace... I would have liked to see a little bit more because he's not just a whiny baby trying to cut his teeth. He he truly is trying to serve and be of service and, and see his mother on her rightful throne. And, you know, I'm, I'm with him and he's a fantastic actor as well. So, you know, any of that, I think we could have had a little more of than, than anything with Damon. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of Damon and Jace, you know, like, they they went from last season of Jace trying to be the diehard honor student who, like, stays up until 3 a.m. doing his homework to, I'm emulating Damon. So if they could find a way to merge those two aspects of what he's trying to be about before he kicks the bucket, you know, maybe that'd be nice. It's not wrong for someone that age to try to, quote unquote, try on a new personality or persona or whatever. But I think I think to make it really consistent, they have to do that. And they have to have a moment of him reflecting on his uh, true parentage. Well, we got a little bit of that at, at the beginning, but, you know, maybe with another bastard who who has not had the fortune to be passed off as legitimate. Because your quote unquote father is gay and signed your birth certificate. Okay, and then from there we move west into the Riverlands where Damon and Sir Willem Blackwood are trying to secure the Brackens Alliance, um, but they would rather burn. We get a real cool shot um, with the dragon behind the Blackwood. Um, but Damon has need, need of men who would rather die than fold and hatch the plan with Sir Willem to make, a Bra- uh, make the Brackens heal. Um, any any thoughts on this? Kind of gets paid off a little bit more later in the episode. I like how pathetic David came across on Caraxes during the parley scene. I mean, I think he's just so used to I'll terrify everyone with this that he doesn't know what to do when it doesn't work, you know? And it And it just goes to show how the things he values may not be the best. He's like, oh, they're going to be stubborn and assholes. Hey, I want them on my side. And that just didn't work out well for him. I'm going to repeat myself again and say that uh, the oppositional nature of the Brackens is strange. When you consider there's this enormous dragon in front of you and saying we choose fire means your castle is going to be burnt down into slag. And was it worth being such a dick for this moment? And my point, my criticism here is that a number of characters are needlessly oppositional to Damon in in these scenes just for the sake of making a point. And again, it feels heavy handed, it strains credibility. Uh, I wish they would have some subtlety to it. Yeah, I mean, like, right, you you see these scenes in the moment, and it's just like, oh, yeah, I think it's funny when, you know, Damon can't get it up or whatever, but then it's it does all of this uh, comic relief around Damon's childishness really doesn't really build the idea of him as 
the wonder and terror of his age that he actually that there are actually people who want to follow him they've un- they've well established that enough people hate him but that there are not enough people who like him and that he has qualities that are worth following cuz you know like right so in the beginning of season 1 you know when he was with young Rhaenyra, when he was taking her to the brothel you know like with the puppet show and he told him he told her you know like you have to understand what the common people think of you and it's uh, it's like and here he does it. <laughs> well i mean look he's to in fairness this season you know he you know like when he was talking to cheese he was you know just like ask you know making small talk and like asking what are your vices uh you're into gambling right here's some money to cover your debts right and maybe a little extra the uh, but you know like it's it's not really showing how that translates outside of his crime hoodie and into a leader of men. <laughs> crime hoodie. I love that. You know, the one thing I will say, these scenes with him, uh, this episode in particular, but there's been a couple over this season so far. It's a good contrast to last season where um, showing a lot of restraint from coming from Damon and not just being the loose cannon that uh, we all take him for. You know, there's been a lot of times where he's been very angry and very much could just, he could have burned them all right there, right? And he didn't uh, because he is serving, you know, mostly his own political ends, but uh, he's still team black, you know? And the one thing that he isn't is a turncoat, you know, so... He's more dynamic than you. You think on the surface. Or is he? Is he Team Black though, or is he more just Team Damon? <laughs> and he's currently yeah. black, so he kind of has to be. I mean, if he was, if it was just Team Damon, then he would be fair weathered and go with whatever the winning side is, and then make his moves from there, right? I think, anyway. And I think we've seen that, that small that character a lot <laughs> in this series. We know we know that archetype, right? Damon is different, you know. For what it's worth, Matt Matt Smith insists interview after interview that Damon does not want the throne. That if he'd wanted the throne, he would have made his move much earlier when Viserys was a cripple. And that, you know, he feels that Viserys he feels that Damon is kind of being split apart from his better judgment and from his wife now he's in Harren Hall. But he's playing it. He thinks he's playing it. The Damon does not want the throne for what it's worth. That's an interesting take on that. Um, yeah. And I guess to some extent, a decent point. I mean, we know that he crowned himself the king of the narrow sea, but he he did give that crown up in a very public showing, at least in the in the books, you know. He he does humble himself when the mood or the moment calls for it and i don't know he's just he's more dynamic than he appears at the surface level based on his actions in the past um yeah anything he does is because of his brother or for his brother and you know that little whole king in the narrow sea bit was to get his brother's attention right he had that little smirk mm-hmm. once viserys once he had word that viserys finally sent the fleet but right after that, he went to go challenge the crab feeder to end this, what to end this, and then to finish it before the fleet got there, so that they could, they could say that he actually helped. Right, everything it's it's about his brother, and the it, this this stuff does kind of feel like flanderization because, you know, okay, you know, like he's no, he's the one that's just like wants to like overwhelm every or the enemy with the dragon advantage but then in the book he says you know i have better ways to use the dragons informed by his time in the step zones right my enemy when my enemies heard the beating of caraxes wings or heard his roar they they knew to flee and it's and he doesn't want to risk a dragon going into battle with another dragon right 
Is it fair to say that Damon loved Viserys a lot more than he loves his wife? Yes. I think so, yeah. But I think, okay, so I think with Rhaenyra it's complicated because, yes, she's his brother's little girl, right? But she's also, like, they also connect on their, how in, they're both interested in being quote-unquote true Targaryens, right? But, mm -hmm. so, it's also, like, the aspect of he enjoys corrupting her as an extension of his brother and, you know, like, living in, and, you know, like, or getting a chance at, like, having living with his brother who's, like, more aligned with his interests. But also she's his niece. Well, I think I think that he does love Rhaenyra, but I think he loves the idea of her more than he loves actual marriage. Mm -hmm. You know? Look, that chemistry between him and Millie Alcock was so electric. But again, I mean, I think that's the point, right? And and now that, she, you know, Rhaenyra's popped out a few, at least in the books, you know what I mean? She's not. Oh, yeah. Slender, you know? So I think, I think that puts a strain on a lot of marriages, to be honest. Uh, and with a type like Damon, you know, especially now that she holds authority over him in a, in a big way, you know? she's a threat to him on a lot of levels but especially his ego and pride um but i think, yeah, I think but i think that's what makes him so dynamic is because even even though he has that and there's all the tension there he he doesn't betray her at any point he doesn't he doesn't move against her and he doesn't do anything uber foolish uh to make her more vulnerable uh say yeah. this episode does also <laughs> I mean, not, also, not, that not. was the reason for their big blowout fight around blood and cheese, right? But, uh, well, I mean, I think the fundamental question she asked him, she asked him was like, can you, can you bow to me? Will you let me be your queen? And when, when confronted with that direct question, as opposed to the like, you know, we'll, we'll figure this out, like, he's like, maybe I can't. And I think that's kind of what prompted all of this, you know, was, oh, was yeah. that yeah. realization, wants, you know, like, I that. have to. Like, he had, I think, dreams of, like, them co-ruling or something. But, like, when That's, confronted yeah. with him subordinate on this situation, that was a little too much for him. So Yeah. And I think, you know, in a certain extent, rightly so. I mean, if you go back and you look at their earlier relationship, he, that, I think, is what he's angling for. And, and right. part of what attracts him to her and vice versa. I mean, I think there's this, this implicit promise of we'll rule together like we're getting kings and queens of the past like Aegon the right. Conqueror and his sister right. wives like and then in, in the book at least there's you know he already has the title protector of the realm and you know what he is kind of like this Jar Targaryen generation's version of Reyna Jaehaerys's older sister the queen in the west who was uh Maegor's bride and she you know, like, she was the older one, and, you know, like, she, it really seems like she just wanted to be seen as useful to Jaehaerys and Alysanne and to be included, rather than thought of as a nuisance and, you know, thought of as, you know, just, like, that three's a crowd, right? And that there was no real place for her. Because mm. she'll show up, because Rena will, would show up and, you know... Just like whenever uh, there was, uh, you know, like uh, a crisis, and she'd grumble about, yeah. how, "Oh, brother, you're actually sitting on my throne." But you know, she's, you know, no right. one's. Well, one, she's a woman, so no one actually, no one's actually taking that seriously. But also, she's not making any serious moves to try to claim it herself anyway. So, you know. Yeah, true story characters doomed to being unsatisfied because they don't truly know what they want for themselves. Mm. Well, Raina wants Alyssa Farman. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so bringing it back to the episode, um, we go over to the Eerie, where Lady Erin is speaking with Reyna of how the Eerie is impregnable, save for an attack from the sky. Um, the two spar words, and both admit they mislike feeling weak. Um, again, this is just another one of the House of the Dragon staple short scenes. I don't understand the logic of saying you feel safe except for aerial attack in hey. a world of dragons. That seems to me like, I mean, like, why would you need the words before the except in that sentence? Like, if you're not safe then. You're not safe. <laughs> I, think she's, I think she's trying to hammer home that, like, until this battle, like, because she was never going to be attacked by dragons because she was on the right side. Like, in, before this battle, I was safe, oh. and now I'm not, and this is but why I need you and your dragons. Like, I need you. Yeah, okay. That's this the, dialogue yeah. is straight from the book, except it occurred when Jace went to the Eerie. Okay. Be- right when the war broke out. So, it's it's not that, like... So, this is what she says to Jace, to get, which gets him to promise, I will send you dragons. I still think it's not not good dialogue, but that's yeah. Me. I mean that that is straight from the book though, because uh, you know just the Senya just plopped down on the Eerie and then they surrendered. Wah, wah. Yeah, exactly. I enjoyed the I don't know quirky stilted way that Lady Jane Aaron was sitting and speaking. There was a just a vibe of things being off. Um, that's that's sort of characteristic of the eerie and the veil in general. So that that was just a nice performance by Lady Jane. Yes, she very is, is she the first time that. we're seeing proper Aaron's because, like, I always think that, like, when we get to Game of Thrones, you're not really seeing Aaron's; you're seeing bonkers tallies, aren't you? <laughs> like, we've yeah, never really like seen that. in this world Aaron's just functioning well as rulers, have we? Or am I? I mean, I might be missing something. Oh, you're correct. Lys is a, a Tully and was not truly of the veil, as some characters will remark. <laughs> yeah, we don't get yeah, we don't get proper Aaron's, do we, in the in GOT. But still, it, there's almost something that feels like it's not so much the bloodline, but the locale that makes people a little quirky. It's a high altitude. He's just a not enough Headed, you could say. Off. <laughs> Sugar's pulled up to the table, you know what I mean? Lack of yeah. oxygen. Also, being a, like that dialogue is that's that's that section of the dialogue is only one part of what's said in the book. She, she talks also in the book about how her own kin have tried to replace her as the ruler of the Vale and how she has them in her sky cells. So it doesn't it doesn't feel as helpless. It feels like this is what I do to my enemies. I just have no answer to. You see, now I'm surprised they didn't keep that dialogue in because that would have been a phenomenal contrast against Alison and Rhaenyra who are being overlooked. Well, here's a boss woman who took the ruthless... No, and she literally says... Salman kind of approach, the Saudi approach. I'm going to lock my uncles in in a hotel in Riyadh and I'm going to rule. That would have been really interesting. That would have been another spin on what's now becoming a boring... Because I have to imagine next week will also be a slightly filler, and then there'll be like more kind of a two-part finale. No, she even says in that whole speech, you know, like we women must stand together. That's that's the thesis of the show right there. But they're not using it. Maybe again, but it would like, contradict said, the gender later. essentialism. Sorry, that women are wiser and peace-loving, and so that's of course why they have to get rid of it. <laughs> Like, I'm joking, but I'm being serious in my frustration. Like, god damn. No, you're not. That right. was. You're not right. <laughs> well, Baylor also is going to also a little bit counters that, right? Um, but yes. Ah. Well, let's hope we get it because she sounds definitely more interesting. I should go back and read these books. I feel like a fraud. <laughs> Women are the fair sex. Now, there, you know, we can be ripped open by delivering human lives, the blood, the gore, and literally delivering babies while walking up flights of stairs but we shy (laughs) away from battle and everyone knows that we must always walk behind the men (laughs) 
I'd love any of these male writers just to get like a fucking heavy period. Right. <laughs> they should, you know what they should, they should wear those like, like tens in it. That simulate cramps. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was just thinking that. I was just thinking that. (laughs) (laughs) Like perimenopause, my friends. That night, you know, the meaning of mental and physical pain. Oh, Oh, anyway, onwards we go. Onwards we go. (laughs) Puts fire and blood in a new meaning. Oh. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy. (laughs) <laughs> and then uh, from there, we go back to Dragonstone, where Rhaenyra has her mini therapy session with her master of whispers, and then being reminded that wars are won in more than just battle. Again, I feel like this episode has a lot of short scenes that pay off later. Yeah, moving characters to where they need to go. I mean, yeah, sensible. Not much to say about it, I guess. Why not? That's really. You're robotizing. Oh, sorry. Am I better now? (laughs) Sorry, just want to leave. Wars are wings and words are robots. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Am I still robotic? Now you're okay. You just went for a minute there. Right right when you were making your point, it went. <laughs> Good. <laughs> They're trying to silence me because they know. I'm... That's it. So this scene leads to Alinda, the handmaiden, being sent to King's Landing to contact Diana, uh, the former maid. I was just interested if anyone has any idea what's going to happen from this, because I'm stumped. This is clearly the setup for the payoff. I don't know what it is. I'm assuming that we'll get it will get some bit of this will pay off more like during the sacking of King's Landing. But if she can get rally the the, the common people again, for her side, you know. Or spread the word of whatever... Uh, sort of uh, base swapping scheme they're doing. Although they're they're not coordinated enough with Damon to do it, so if they're maybe they're going to turn that on its head too. Like with Rook's Rest or Is it is it just to have an eye, eyes on the inside? Like someone a connection, getting the lay of the land, yeah, planting some words, but you know, potentially now, well, at, at the end of the episode, with what we know is to come to find certain people. I don't know. It must be just to stir some shit with the small folk, right? Yeah, that's all I can think of because they didn't really give us anything else. Well, and then I mean that it might they've got to feed that into the shepherd thing at some point, right? Like, are we gonna see him? This Either season? that, or, I mean, it feels like they they could be using this to feed into both maybe that or uh, dragon seeds as well. But again, we don't. Well, and they they, yeah, we did get a little touch of that uh, with Rhaenyra and. Um, Bela this season or this episode so right I imagine I imagine dragon seeds will be kind of the focus of next week a little bit and then uh but it'll still feel 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 filler and then seven and eight will be bigger I I think we'll we'll find that it breaks away from the pattern of like big episode filler big episode filler right here where we have kind of back-to-back filler and then a big two-part finale. At least I'm kind of hoping yeah, for it. Otherwise, it, that pace would oh, You're robotizing again. Sorry. Damn it! <laughs> That's okay. Um, and then from here, we go to um, Bela and Rhaenyra. Remember, uh, they're remembering Rainy fondly. And Ramirez says to Bela that she is much like her in some ways. 
and that she has to depend on her now. Um, and then she also gives her a box with the hand of the kingpin in it to give to her grandsire, which is just a nice little touching scene, I thought. Hashtag give me more Bela. Give me more Bela. That's, that's right. what I want. Cool. And then, um, awesome. And then from here, we move to Damon with Motherfucker. <laughs> But how did you all know it was his mum? I, I, I mean, I, fucking hell. Am I missing something? Like, the internet's had to tell me this. The interweb told me this. She calls him her favourite son, which is obviously yeah. his own projection. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Damon never really lived to get to know Alyssa, but Damon really, truly really is Alyssa's son. Oh. So I think in this scene, we all felt the moment that they over-egged the pudding, and we went from implied haunted shenanigans two episodes ago to some full-on gothic horror that's interesting from a character level to just over the top, Ugh, I don't want to see this anymore. Is, is this in the books? Is it Because I know, you know, George has his horror writing strand, right? I mean, in many ways, he started off in that strand, in that genre. Is this in the books, or is this... If there was a matra, you know, matricidal conolingus, I, I, it, <laughs> I think I must have been looking away from this. Remember too. that I one. Don't, I don't remember this at all. Maybe my head cannons just blocked it out because it can't take more. Like too much. No, this happening. is not in the book. Is yeah, I was gonna say this. Yeah. There is, not. there is no mention of any kind of Damon Alice Rivers interaction during Damon's time at Heron Hall. Although it doesn't mean. It didn't happen, so. No, I mean, I don't remember it watching the episode. I must have, like, gone to make a cup of tea or something. <laughs> oh, no. Um, yeah, that, I, we all cut that. Or momentarily checked my Instagram or something. Maybe I'm better <laughs> off just not going back and rewinding and seeing it. I think I'll, I'll just leave that one. I'll leave that one in the vault. <laughs> it's like, everyone's saying he fucked his mom. Like, I didn't see it. What, what are... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you really need to see it? Like, do you feel like you missed something important? <laughs> well, I was going to go back and watch it until you mentioned kind of lingers, and I was like, oh, fuck it. Yeah, no. well, you don't need to see that. Well, actually, like, but if, it been, been, if, if you if look it had at been the canon, I would have felt obliged. That's but if it's not a foreshadowing book, for the dragons later, so you should go back and watch it. God. It's foreshadowing okay. for the god's eye. That's what it is. Oh, God, that was really bad. Sorry. Oh, no. That's, cool. that's some old school battles of King's Grave spot there. I love it. I love right. it. Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry about that. I feel Mimi, Mimi somewhere would be proud of us at this moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Showed her in God's eye right there. <laughs> that's going to be the name of this episode now. <laughs> Going down on the God's eye. So moving on the uh, from the Oedipus complex of this scene, um, he does come to, and he's at the table with Sir Simon and some small folk, um, which were a great comic relief in this scene. Um, Alice Rivers is sending dagger eyes at him. Damon anticipates that he will have a large host of river, river run bannermen and asks how the renovation is going. Sir Simon tells him that Heron Hall is desperate and that maybe the queen could cover the cost. And he said, no, he'll guarantee the payment himself, himself, and also reminds him that maybe you should call me king. On sort. And then the shoe drops. I love the bit when he said, king, consort. Like, that last word didn't seem necessary. <laughs> that Sir Simon is bold, I'll say that. Yeah. Sir Simon's <laughs> strong. I mean, he's just like a quiet badass, isn't he? I just I love I love spending time with him, and I love the actor Simon Russell Beale is just such a cool actor, and yeah he just brings just a quiet slightly mischievous heft to this role which I love. Wyman Manderley vibes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah. Now you say it, definitely. I do like how they're bringing up gold now because Team Black don't have gold. 
I was going to say that I think that line is now going to bring up more conspiracies <laughs> if you're going to compare to Manderley. <laughs> the fans will all start thinking, what's he planning? Well, he looks like he eats a good pie, doesn't he? <laughs> Fray pie. Yeah, I was going to say, he actually reminds me a, a little bit more of the... Uh, uh, Grand Grand Master. Oh, his face. Pycelle. Yeah, Pycelle. All right. So then we move on to the Golden Dragons Council, and the Grand Master updates the status of the king. Um, the crown is in need of a regent to rule in Aegon's stead, and Alethin assumes the position herself, as she has before. But the council says girls can't rule. And then Kristen Cole names Amond Prince Regent. Amond immediately takes a seat at head of the council and gets to work, including closing the city for anyone to come or go and cutting down the rat catchers. What are you guys' thoughts? I mean, Kristen's not going to be getting any for a while now. <laughs> like, the look on her face, like, even you? I'm fucking you and you won't pick me. I got the impression that they had, like, broken up, or she was putting him in, like, the doghouse or something, so I was, I mean, I understand why she's so very upset, but, like, Alison, you got no right to complain. You brought this on yourself. I actually don't see that this scene, is, think that this scene is flanderizing because this is just Alison finding out the natural consequences of her actions, but... Mm -hmm. Finally feeling the repercussions and being in, put in Rhaenyra's exact position. There, there, are. there are some phenomenal like internet memes about no shit, woman who exploited patriarchy to unseat mate now discovers she's victim of patriarchy. Like right. the internet's yeah. hitting this up. From a Team Black perspective, I definitely don't care, but from a practical perspective, I... I don't see why there isn't a little more cordiality, but, you know, a little more team up between Allison and Eamon here, other than maybe they're trying to portray Eamon as a one-man band and, uh, you know, far more sinister character behind that eye patch. Well, I mean, if he's going to rule... He if she steps in, he, he, he loses his chance. This is his one big chance he's been fighting for, which he made happen, even though he doesn't admit this. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just think they're, they're trying to play him very, like, mad, psychopathic Targaryen, and I'm not sure that... I mean, I, I, other than the complexes that he had from childhood, I'm not sure that that's really true of him, necessarily. Um, so I don't know that I'm digging on it too much, but I mean, whatever, whatever tears Team Green apart is fine with me. So <laughs> I just I can't stand Allison Tower or Otto. So. Book show doesn't matter. I'm not a you fan. do get the sense that she assumed that this would happen and didn't do the pre-meeting legwork to whip votes, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How immediate was this this council, you know? Uh, was she, like, at his bedside, at Aegon's bedside too long and, and missed her chance to, you know, do a little of that? Even before that, how long did it take between when Aemond got back from the battle and when Aegon's body got back to the battle? Got back from the well, battle. and they didn't send a raid. I mean, they must have sent a raven ahead saying that the king was gra grievously injured, right? Like, get the maesters ready. No? That's a good question. They, I mean, like, they took the castle, and, you know, even the smaller keeps have maesters. Well, and Rook, Rook's Rest isn't, like, all that far away, so even if they didn't want to risk a raven, they must have sent a messenger along, you would imagine. I don't want to get bogged down in logistical logistical chat of how fast a raven could fly or something, but I'm probably I'm pretty sure Aemond on his dragon going back to King's Landing could right. deliver all of this as a message. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, and then um 
real quick before we move on to um the next scene it seems that a drawn snow has um come forth in our court i'm assuming it's to apologize naturally for crimes against the crown um so john snow oh i just came to see if uh, y'all are ready to bend the knee and uh i'm willing to accept oh the fealty to the crown um <laughs> you know nothing lord snow get out of here clearly, Ooh, clearly i know yes. something oh we shall see we shall see mm-hmm. all right i'll have the king's gold escort him out all right it was nice seeing you all It was good to see, uh, you know, that shot, that final shot of Allison just like staring at Crispy without showing, or just like the close up on Allison as she's staring at Crispy, but not showing Crispy's face. Yeah. Realization she's lost all of her allies. Mm-hmm. Laris has done her, done her in the back, and Crispy's PTSD. This scene is like the high quality yin to the low quality yang in terms of um, the, exemplifying the place of women and all, all the, the various women related themes that the show's trying to tell. So I just wish there were more scenes like this. The King's Landing small council scenes have been consistently pretty great, though, I think. Almost makes me think they purposely did it now. Hmm. All right, but moving on from the council scene, um, we see Eamon's actions being taken quite quickly. Um, so Hugh Hammer and his family are feeling the desperation of the Sea Snakes blockade and need to escape to Tumbleton. Um, and then Allison meets Cole down in the yard where he's overseeing Eamon's orders. She accuses him for knowing what Eamon has become and that he only wants her in the night. Cole, however, has seen what this war is, a war given to the dragons, melted armor, men walking on fire. Allison wasn't asked to be spared these details, nor did she give Cole leave to speak her name. So what are your guys' thoughts? Uh, it sounds like uh, her or him only coming to her in the night is what you wanted to begin with, so. Yeah, I could agree. Kind of like now that she's not necessarily under her control or under her, um, kind of throwing it back in his face to kind of get it back. Eamon's really got a reputation um, now, I feel, kind of more akin to Book Damon. He's got the presence, the, the bad, you know, the a second Mago the Cruel, if you will. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. And then moving along, we get a uh, horde of small folk, small folk heading towards the gate, including Hugh and his family. Gold, clothes, gold cloaks close and bar the gates, holding the horde back, exclaiming the orders of the prince regent that no one may come or go, and a small riot ensues, um, which is just great. I love that we're already getting the unrest of the small folk. He thought it was in a bad way. It's telling, isn't it? There are so many of these small scenes that are just getting people in the right place or plot in the right place that none of us have any comment on. <laughs> right, right. It's telling. Honestly, this is yeah. okay. Because they don't, <laughs> they don't say much on their own. It's all about where yeah. it's going to lead. And it's either, either exactly. it's obvious where it's leading or we know where it's leading or we have no idea. So there isn't much to say about them now, you know, which is fine. And I, I mean... Thought, I thought it was a good enough. Sorry, man. All I was going to say is, I mean, and if it turns out that it leads to something good, then great. Then this scene was great, or these scenes were great. And if they don't go anywhere, then eh, whatever. <laughs> I, th- I think that's a luxury that the screenwriters could give themselves if this was a series that you binged. But because it is week by week, I think you punish right. when there are inelegant building blocks that all come together and hold things up, then you punish it more. Like, going back at the end of the season, if you go back and watch it all as one, you're probably going to not mind so much. But I do think when they go into season three, they need to give more of a care to the fact that this is week by week. And so the actual construction of each episode and making sure that the episodes themselves cohere 
and have enough interest and momentum is important. Mikhail talks a lot about this on Dragoncast. Yeah, it's uh no, Ulf was in uh was it last week's episode or the week before? This is Q the Hammer. Oh the other okay. dragon seat. Okay. They dropped, they dropped a little nugget about his wife being from Tumbleton, and obviously they've changed Hugh in the sense that he's uh, in King's Landing and not Dragonstone. So interesting. I think there's, they've got a plan there. They've, they've given, I missed that. They've dug themselves a grave, but they've brought a, they've brought a ladder <laughs> to get out of that pit. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, he, he says, where would we go, right? And she's like, my... My sister in Tumbledon or something. I totally, I totally didn't pick up on that. Stupid. Yeah, me either. Because <laughs> they're pretty pivotal at that battle, right? Or that's yeah, that's, that's when that's, that's when he turns. The two betrayers. You can already see the uh, product differentiation that's going into Hugh versus Ulf the Sot, where Hugh's clearly fussing over his sick daughter and wants to do the right thing, where Ulf seems a little bit less uh, on the straight and narrow. So that's just an interesting... Because we really get nothing of the two betrayers in the books. They're just two characters that go side by side. But that's interesting. No, and I, I do appreciate that a lot because they are just one note characters in the book. And then from there, um, we are at the twins where Jace is treating with Lord and Lady Frey in the center of their framed bridge. Um, basically, what they want is Heron Hall, and Jace says um, that his mother would require a lot more for that, and the price would be a bent knee. Um, I thought this was a cool scene, uh, specifically just because I like the idea of them treating in the middle of the bridge on a door. Yeah, that was cool. That's a wonderful shot. Cool, Bray. And I do think this would have been one of the scenes that would have benefited if we did get more of Jatheris before this point. But it is, too, a nice scene to show that he's actually competent and not an idiot when it comes to politicking. Yeah, and this is uh yeah, this is exactly what he was doing on his trip north. So, you know, like Jane Aaron wants a dragon. Very well, we will send you dragons. And, you know, then the Manderleys are still bitter about the Targaryen bride that never was. So he promises them Joffrey. So and then he goes to Winterfell and uh hangs the Cregan. So it's it is a little odd that they're choosing to put this here but again i'm glad that like they're still like showing this aspect and he's not just trying to be damon 2.0 like Eamon is although it is a little odd to see him just like people teleporting around the riverlands and to to just it 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 it, it, it does kind of strain belief that uh his uh, that he'd be able to get there so quickly and without drawing so much attention. Yeah, it's a little bit little finger, isn't it, to zapping about the realm? Yeah, and it's like, okay, we've established that if you fly at night, you're probably not going to get caught, but then you also can't really see where you're going, so. Well, I imagine the dragons know where they're going, you know, and can see very well in the dark themselves. I feel like, though, if you flew on anything but a, a, you know, moonless night, that might be really revealing, though, as well. I suppose if you if you swept wide over the narrow sea and back, you know, and came in at it from the north, you would be in less danger. True. Yeah, they're not they're naturally. So, or people trying to stay out of it altogether. I enjoyed seeing a fray trying to become effective Lord Paramount of the Trident. 
I mean, the whole family is just buffoons, aren't they? Full Frey in the book. Forrester Frey, I think. But, like, totally unselfaware. Mm, you guys were saying that, uh, Alexander, you said that uh, the price for Heron Hall was for the for just House Frey to bend the knee, or I took it to mean that, like, you have to go and drum up support among the others. That's why I took it, because uh, didn't he say bent knees? Yeah, he yeah, just yeah, bent knees. It can mean... That was just my summary. Oh, no, 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 no worries. Uh, that's, that's, that is literally what he said, or but what, did, what was meant by it. I took it to mean that like, you have to actually take initiative and find other people besides... Yeah, for, you know, flex on, on the other lords, or at least, at very least your vassal houses. Call in favors with the other lords of equal standing, or... Yeah, and call your banners... And be ready. I took it as just the phrase that they, we know from mostly uh, Game of Thrones that they're quite they have a pivotal geographical location, so they are worth more. And Jace is giving away a castle he doesn't really have. It's it's quite an easy one, I think. But I mean, I took it to mean like if if somebody's trying to cross that isn't for black, get them to be or don't let them cross either. I I think there was more implied there, and part of the larger terms that we see we you know is off screen for us, because I mean, wouldn't that be the price anyway? Right, a bent knee, like right. For Heron Hall, yeah. So I, I think that there's a lot more uh, terms and conditions that apply to that arrangement. Mm. And if not, then he is a buffoon for giving that away. Like, for, for just that one else. Fuck him. Heron Hall has always been a false promise. Right, it's like, sure, you want Heron Hall? Take it. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, though. Cursed. Hey, L. Speaking of Karen Hall. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey, everyone. Um, did you get my lemon cakes? If not, it was a four. It was a four? Yes. I a cup of a four. Everybody here is giving it like three to four, give or take. Yeah, probably more accurate is 3.75. Um, there were some highlights, mostly lows, but some highs in there. Um, the call of the dragon tryouts, which was super exciting. Um, the scene where Allison actually realized that she was not getting picked. Hmm. That was pretty cool. Um, but definitely, uh, I'm really ready for them to kind of move on haunted hair and hall. All right, and then um, we were just moving on from Jace treating with the phrase. Did you have any comments about that theme? Did we figure out uh, who exactly were the Lord and Lady? Was the Lord and Lady? Uh, somebody just here said Forrester Frey, I think. There is a there's a Frey in the books, right? The he openly asked Rhaenyra for his for her hand in marriage, and uh was forever known as Fool Frey. <laughs> right. Right. That would be Forrest Frey, uh, mar- married to uh, Sabatha Viprin. The inclusion of Lady Frey seems seems to suggest that this is indeed Sabitha Frey who will be playing a greater role in the future. That was what I was uh, on my mind as well. Uh, I just didn't no, were they kind of maybe this was someone else, another lord and Lady Frey and Forrest and Sabbath that would come up later. Uh, I just wasn't sure if that was confirmed. I had it in my yeah, head that Sabbath was younger than what they did for Lady Frey that was at the treaty table. She seemed older, didn't she? Yeah. Maybe it was just the veil, though. Possibly, possibly. I just figured uh, Sabbath of Viper would look younger, considering her role later on. But, you know, 
definitely no ageism <laughs> I'm trying to do, but uh, definitely <laughs> not what I was imagining her to be. All righty. And then um, from the twins, we move back down to Heron Hall, where we find Damon splitting wood as Alice River looks on. She chides him for doing manual labor and speaks of how she hears strange things upon the wind. She calls for him out for his war crimes, and he tells her that he will make himself king, and Rhaenyra is welcome to join him as his queen. And then Alice says it must be a pity he never knew his mother, and then at that moment, Sir Simon brings word of the Bracken's fealty. What do you guys think about this? He's a witch. Anyone else kind of over Alice? A little bit too much Alice? <laughs> but does she weigh as much as a duck? It does seem like a, a weird motivation to ascribe to Alice Rivers, who, not that we get an intense character description in the books, but who seems very much concerned with her power and her advancement and all things personal. So having her be this voice for the justice for the small folk is a little strange. Presumably this is going somewhere. Uh, yeah, sure. I definitely didn't take Alice Rivers as a community activist. At least I haven't. Not someone who traditionally gets gets with uh, Aemon who firebombs the Riverlands very soon after. It's like, oh yeah, that's hot. He even says, right, he even, Damon even says, right, if, if Aemon ever met you, he cut you in half. Right, the only way to square this circle is that she's just trying to clearly play on people's insecurities, and, you know, for all the atrocious shit he does, Damon does have the common touch, and the, and Eamon is into MILFs, so it seems like she's just using what's at, his dis at her disposal. Maybe that was even her that Damon was fucking when, instead of in, when he was hallucinating about his mom. Certainly where my mind went. I agree. And then from there we go back to Corliss, who is still grieving. Um, and he is found by Bela on a dock overlooking the narrow sea. Um, he sees his grief only through his own eyes and believes the handship is nothing more than to placate his loss. And when Bela says the grief is not only his to bear, he says he would make her heir to Driftmark. And she says, I am fired in blood. Driftmark must pass to salt and sea, which, fuck yeah. Hashtag give us more. Yes, please. More Corliss, more Baylor. Yeah. Great scene. Yeah, so, so well done. And then after that, Rhaenyra meets privately with Sir Alfred um, to apologize to him and then send him to Heron Hall and find out more of Damon's intentions. Um, and she says her message for him is that she would very much like to continue their last conversation. Any thoughts on this? Was this part of the plot with Miss Arya? To kind of get rid of Brune? Yeah, this is just, you know, like when in A Storm of Swords, when uh, Catelyn is suspicious of uh, King Westerling's relatives, you know, like she tells Rob, you know, about one of like her male relatives, you know, like, find some task that is worthy of him so as not to offend him, but just send him away. And, you yeah, know, that's, that's exactly that, and that's exactly what Viserys failed to do with Damon. Partially because the realm was at peace, but... Alright, and then we're back at Hall, where Damon is woken at the Hour of the Wolf as the river lords have come to treat with them urgently. They're unhappy as their lands have been pillaged, their people assaulted, livestock taken, all barbaric acts in war. The people doing this are proudly displaying Rhaenyra's red dragon on black. Lena appears to Daemon, asking if he's cared for their daughters. The river lords remind Daemon that the riverlands are an ancient place, watched over by old gods and new, and will not raise their banners to a tyrant. 
the history of the Riverlands would beg to disagree. You heard of a uh, right. Harren the Black, right? You Riverlands got fucking owned. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the Dunder the um, Stormlands either. The Randons. So what are they talking about? Yeah, they're being needlessly catty and snippy <laughs> to Damon for reasons to let him know that he's a dum dum for being a big meanie and stuff. One way to slap him back into his place, you know. And. You don't know. Uh, I do wonder how Damon will respond to that message, though. If right. he'll if he'll be more inclined to also continue that conversation or kind of say, you know, well, fuck off. I said what I said. It is what it is. Like, kind of thing, you know. But he does need them. So, like. <laughs> yeah. See, and I just love this, too, because, you know, right before this, he was just like, yeah, you guys got to call me king. And then the next scene we get with him is an act of kingship that he completely fails immediately. Well, and, and and that's what I'm saying is maybe he is more primed to d- continue that dialogue with R- Rhaenyra now that he sees that, you know, being king is not all it's got to do. It's not just, the, you know, let you out here and you know let you out there and get all the glory it's a difficult job that perhaps given his experiences and these little you know peyote trips that he's been on maybe he will be more uh primed to hey you deal with all the bullshit and i get i reap all the rewards and i get to take my dragon and fuck off i can do better for you and yeah I'll be your king consort. Maybe. King consort. <laughs> it seems like this was their chance to, or this this point in the sequence was their chance to do it, but then they decided to have him choose to do this, which is really just a repeat of blood and cheese, but... But so far in this season, pacing has been odd. And they kind of leave leave things sort of half finished and pick them up in the next episode. But yeah, no. When people talk about like a second, or would Damon be a second Megor? If Damon is doing this stuff, then yes, it's. But uh, but this is also very hard to believe. Book Damon doing. Right. Agreed. It's like he's dumb and he's selfish in ways, but he's also very shrewd. Like, he is a shrewd commander. Otherwise, he would have had the gold cloaks remain on his side after all the stuff and years away, right? Mm-hmm. We've seen enough of him being a good leader of men, though. I don't think we've seen very much at all. So that must be taking him in a different direction, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, but that comes back to the flanderization, right, of just, you know, like, to serve this narrative of, you know, all the the women want is peace, and, you know, it's just all these men egging them on into this conflict. You know, and just, uh, and, which is, you know, it's reductive and it leads to shifting all of these or shifting the bur- until you know look until they start Venera's descent then it's taking or it's shifting all of this poor decision making onto the others in her inner circle and mostly Damon you know that's interesting, and it, it makes me think of your original point in your lemon cakes, where we are seeing it sort of really hammered in at this point, the, you know, anti-feminist workings of this world. But if you look back at season one, especially with Damon, um, and and now there there is a juxtaposition shown 
where it's it's equally hard to be a man in this world. You're, you're sort of never man enough, and you have all these lords sitting around you, egging you on to do this and that, and trying to be your puppet master. Um, you know, and I don't want to be a, you know, a, what is it? A trad, a trad wife? Is that what they call it nowadays? But, but it, it, you know, it is, it's difficult to be a man and they have their own sets of pressures and things that are placed on them and complexes that are bestowed upon them and hammered into them from younger ages and things. So it, that's an interesting, um, dichotomy, you know, that lives within himself. Bad and toxic. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh. it's all bad and toxic. Yeah, but there's also, you know, like, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, you know, like, stupidness of them, the writers choosing to repeat this. It's more, it's because it's just, like, I think Damon would understand that, you know, like, you know, caught up in a blood feud, even if it's between kin. It just sucks that they hit the toddler, or, or, or that they killed the toddler instead of Amond. But you know, like to deliberately do this again, and now we're only now we're seeing actual blowback to Damon for it because, like, we we were told in previous episodes that some supporters had. At least seemed sympathetic to Rhaenyra, but then thought blood and cheese was a bit, was a bridge too far, right? So that they they ultimately didn't declare for Rhaenyra or outright declared for Aegon. But and but you know, like yeah, the only mention we've really had of it was you know that Bracken kid calling Rhaenyra a kinslayer to that Blackwood boy before the Battle of the Burning Mill broke out. It just feels sloppy in a lot of ways. Yeah, but again, it's filler, and we kind of just have to take that for what it is. Again, they're, they're really trying to milk what essentially, I mean, if you if you boil it down to just the actual dialogue given and the actual firsthand accounts that are in that book, it's not a very long book. I mean, even even George milks it. And then these, oh, and now yeah. these showrunners are milking it even further. So we just, I mean, we have to buckle up for a lot of that in this series. And well, that's okay. Yeah, but, you know, instead you could have had, you know, like more development of the younger generation of Team Black, which does feel underdeveloped at this point. True. Right. True. Yeah. And I, and I and... would have rather. But again, you've got Matt Smith under contract, probably for X right. amount of you know, screen time and, and you got, you, there's just a lot of logistics that go into, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, BAFTA and SAG contracts and there's all this stuff. There's IATSE things that are all considerations on the back end that, you know, that's where shows kind of have these weird, weirder moments as opposed to film in some ways. Yeah, but you know, you also know what would have featured Damon too of have, bringing his first wife back, so you can complete the series of the dead or of all the wives coming back to diss him, like at the end of the Tudors. Yeah, it feels frustrating because there are some really inspired scenes that they've taken, and and so this one being just a bit of a dud. You know they can do better, and they can they can do a good job, like in the Baylor and Corliss scene, of adding a wonderful scene that we didn't get in the books. And then, then when they drop the ball, it, it makes it that much more noticeable. Yeah. I would agree. All right, and then um, from there we go to uh, King's Landing. And um, the serving girl has arrived. And after using Masaria's name, is escorted um, by a gold cloak into the city to find someone or something. We kind of touched around uh, on this already, um, unless anybody came up with something else. All right, and then um, from there we go uh, back to Corliss, and he's sitting with his hand pin, hand pin, and contemplates while Aemon contemplates the Iron Throne. 
Um, and then Helena is there behind him, and he she asks him, "Was it worth the price?" Um, and I'm gonna leave this guy to you because I feel like people have something to say. They're really not giving the Aemon Helena shippers much to work with this season, are they? <laughs> it's almost like a fuck you. It's like these two are not doing it. Suck it. All your theories are stupid. <laughs> Oh, I mean, since this leaves off, right? Uh, oh, go ahead. Please, Nettles. Please. Oh, I, I was saying, uh, what price exactly you know, would he be paying? He obviously, uh, once his brother's dead, he's coveting, coveting the throne. I would say that it's, you know, shaping up to kind of be working for him in his favor. Maybe Kinsling, because she knows her husband will die. Or just the general, like, he paid an eye for his dragon, right? Like, in the general, like, was it worth that? Or, like, this is the road it's brought you down? Yeah. They, they don't exactly have a plethora of dragons. Or, you know, maybe it's referring to the god's eye. I don't know. I think it's more just the price to us or to me, you know, to her. I actually like that stuff. Yeah. Does Helena see? Like if I'm, a, I'm assuming the implication here is that she is basically saying to him, I know what you did. I mean, that's what I took from that scene. I don't know if the rest of you took it that way, but I felt like that's what they were going for. While yeah, leaving that's it. What I felt while leaving that's what it I felt on open. a literal level. Yeah. yeah, but that's the literal level, but I think it also like with Helena, you have to ask about what the deeper level is. So Right. Mm-hmm. And I did and I did see it as a, you know, what price, you know, was it worth it more so uh especially with Helena, you know, coming in and that being her scene as a not so much as what he did, but what he will do well and and you know we know she's a dreamer but i wonder if she's sort of doing like a janice thing here looking forward looking back you know the price is already paid the price is to be paid this one here in this moment you know um maybe time works a little bit differently for her because i i always get like from home if she's more than a dreamer yeah, it's Sorry, baby brand vibes, yeah. isn't it? It feels like it she's is, yeah. that like, you. But she's sort of like in the rivers of time and going forth and back. But um, again, is that more so than book? Because in the book, I felt she was more a dreamer for what I remember, right. like going but, forward. Have they have they actually on the screen confirmed that she dreams? Like, have we actually talked about it? Did I miss uh, it? More or less with the with the she was she was sewing. Uh, uh, not me. Or what's the other one's name? Uh, they, she was sewing his his burial shroud the episode before Blood and Cheese, and what then I'm she saying, says, "That's for him. my point." They've hinted, they've hinted, and they've like, if you're really, really paying attention. But do you think that like a non-book reader just watching the show would pick up on this stuff and realize that's what's going on? Oh no! no. Usually the show no. is more explicit, especially about the supernatural stuff. And here we're being. Why don't you ask your wife? Why don't Why don't you love the lovely lady Liana and see if she figured it out? Right. Or did you just tell her? (laughs) I definitely spilled the bean. I think a non-book reader with access to the internet has by now. Fair point. Been advised of the fact that. Or married to to what Helena's. Yeah, pay attention to what she says. But this wasn't in the book, and Martin says it on his blog too. So. Right. More, more to the point I'm getting to is I think it's an interesting choice to not really tell the audience this, that aren't book readers, that they're letting it be subtle enough that people can pick it up. You know, I mean, people may get it in, you know, some post on whatever or, or some there's probably articles like what did you miss and stuff like that. And I'm sure that's all out there. But I mean, it's an interesting choice that the, the showrunners are choosing not to tell us this and let us kind of figure it out, it out on its own. I'm wondering if there's going to be like a big moment somewhere where it like is revealed. You know, I feel like Maybe. they might be building that. Yeah. 
They kind of did tell us though in the during the royal hunt episode in season one, Viserys was telling Alicent about how some Targaryens are prophetic dreamers while she's pregnant with Helena. But like I said, kind of. They're but hinting. again, kind it's of. subtle. No, on on right. the screen, it hasn't been explicitly stated that Helena is the three eyed dragon. But maybe it will be. I mean, I would say every scene that has Helena featured is uh, deliberately shot to this effect to be hinting. She'll be saying weird things. She'll be looking out of it. She's presented Mm -hmm. as neurodivergent, I guess you could say. So I would say the hinting is pretty strong. That's what I mean about her being more than a dreamer is the the clear attempt at at showing that she is neurodivergent, that she is somehow on another level, and it's very uh, it, it's very shades of like uh, you know Dune and 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 stuff to me, like with uh, Alia, you know, in in Dune. If you've ever read that, she she really gives me vibes of that. These little asides that she says, you know, and if you're paying attention, I think whether you're a book reader or not, you could pick up on at least that to Michael's point. I do enjoy that they've gone there with the dreams and that they've made it a theme. And now we've seen, obviously, Helene is a theme like you guys have discussed, but uh, with Damon in Aaron Hall, it's such a massive part in uh, the book series is A Song of Ice and Fire, so it's great that they've gone there, especially with Duncan Egg on the horizon and Dreams being a massive part of that too, so. All right, and then from there, um, Egan lies in bed, badly burns, um, but says mummy after Alicent takes the leave, um, which again, another short scene, but this one I actually really liked because this show and the actor have made me like uh, Egan the second a lot more than in the book. Any thoughts on this one? Not that that's saying much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I have chosen my counselor so well. Yeah. Yeah. But so I mean, he's. Uh... I mean, they they've definitely made him more interesting character. I mean, even even George says so. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, but you know, like, yeah, I mean, considering what they've, the commitment they've made with Steve Green, you know, it's, uh, going to be interesting to see, uh, Allison making Eamon her new scapegoat now that Aegon is actually doing nothing as she requires and he's not lucid enough to contradict her. In any way. All right. And then back on Dragon. Sorry, what was that, Hannah? Oh, I was just saying, nor nor will he ever be again lucid enough to. Uh, Not quite. After his injuries on after his injuries on Dragonstone, he swears off all the milk of the poppy. And speaking of dragons, oh my god, I would love if they did that. Um, but yeah, moving to Dragonstone for the last scene, um, Rhaenyra is reading about Vithenium when Jethiris returns. Um, she's proud of him for what he has done for the cause, but she's still upset because of her inability to do more than haunt the halls of Dragonstone. Um, Jay springs up that we have plenty of dragons, and that they're there are those of their line that have fallen from the tree. And we are left with a big old hint for dragon seed. Okay, I like the line. Gonna of get... Please settle. <laughs> yes, I was saying, I was wondering how are they going to, now we're setting up for dragon seeds, how are they going to get the uh, King's Landing one? Dragonstone. Or is there something going to be, they get there after? King's Landing, when Rhaenyra gets there. Uh, I'm just kind of 
not sure uh, what they're going to do with them as far as placement and uh, the tryout. Is that why Rhaenyra's lady in waiting went to King's Landing to have them kidnap all these dragon seeds and bring them to Dragonstone? There you go. No point. That's a very good question. Right, because otherwise it's just like, well, how's Lucky Hammer tried to leave for Templeton, but they clearly did not make it through the gate. So how are they going to get him on Vermithor? Yeah, and Ulf is still in King's Landing as well. Mm hmm. But, uh, no, I like how Rhaenyra, or the the writers had Rhaenyra mentioned that Reyna tried to claim a dragon. So, but that line belonged in Reyna's own mouth during the conversation when Rhaenyra was sending her away. It's like, please, your grace, don't send me away. I'll claim a dragon. And then Rhaenyra can counter, like, with what? You've tried, like, ten times already, and you nearly died the last time. You know? Yeah, it would have been more fitting there, and not not so much of an, as you know, Rhaena tried to do this, and it didn't work. <laughs> mm hmm What I think we need is a scene of Rhaena trying to mount the little baby dragons, sort of hobby horse style, and tame them young like that. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Maybe getting fitted for a really, really tiny saddle. Right? <laughs> my first dragon. Yeah. My little dragon. <laughs> my little dragon. No, but it was nice to see Jace standing up for Reyna. You know, you can see how the uh, the teenagers on Team Green, or sorry, Team Black, excuse me, uh, you know, they actually, you know, care about each other and you know like no matter like they're they are trying to look out for each other in like yeah the, like the a more destructive closeness way. of the of team black outside of damon you know damon being the outlier there is is a nice juxtaposition to all the infighting and scheming and stuff on on green is there the legitimate heirs? There's nothing to fight about. <laughs> like, when you're the usurpers, you're all going to usurp each other. It's not surprising. I think that's just one more build-up to, you know, the show uh, showing Rhaenyra as kind of, like, thoughtless or, you know, kind of less blaming, so to say. You know, my family's great. Everyone gets along. This was taken from me. Which I, you know, just really curious. So what is that going to do to her defense? As you know, someone just said for the of her character and her personality and her and her emotional state in the book. If you know she's completely blameless. Did you say Rhaenyra less explaining? Blame, uh, blaming. Oh, because I was going to say, uh, yeah, less blaming for now. <laughs> Yeah, for now, for now, but uh, you know, oh, her chips are being stacked up pretty high. You know, what are they going to do with that? Like, what what scene or what event could make it to kind of at least set it on par? Now, if not equalized, then at least set it on par with, you know, both sides have done horrible, terrible things, and she's committed her own war crimes, you know, herself. So what could possibly happen to kind of even or level that out? You know, I just can't really, from what we've seen, you know, that, you know, in the near future, at least. Maybe next season, but I, I can't see it happening in the near future. Unless they're trying to do something where at the end of their four Rainier, it's it feels a lot more Ned Stark-like, the, the shock for the Unsullied. <clears throat> What you know? I can see is with the dragon seeds of just this is Jace's project, and so Jace is the one who's uh, you know like more building any rapport that exists between them. So when Jace kicks the bucket, there's uh, you know like Rhaenyra oh. doesn't have that foundation of trust, and at least they talked about how trustworthy or or just like whether this is actually a good idea this time, right? 
Um, they at least had a, a like a second to consider that. <laughs> uh, of how could this possibly go wrong? But the um, but I could see them playing. This as this is Jace's project, so he's handling them right. So, so when he dies, there's not much connective tissue left that's leading Nira to trust them, and which is just to make leaving her to be taken over by her fears. Which are in the cases of Hugh Hammer and Ulf the Side. Or no. Yeah, I have to imagine they'll, they'll paint her in some light that causes those characters and other lore to turn out on her. Um, I, ha- I have a feeling that once she's in King's Landing, we'll see sort of a flip again. Um, you know, we'll we'll get more sympathies with Otto and Allison, you know, patching things up and all that kind of stuff. Okay, he's back on sides and, uh, you know, that I have to imagine will be a lot of what season three is, is pulling pulling us more toward Team Green. Um giving us a little more ruthlessness with Rhaenyra once she's in, in King's Landing on the Iron Throne. I just want to point out the irony that we all said nothing happened in this episode and we've now been talking about it for two hours. <laughs> I know, I was thinking that earlier. That's <laughs> us. I mean, that's Classic Vakken and okay. Michelle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, heaven for fairness, something to actually talk about will be here for days. All right, so do you guys have any last thoughts, predictions, anything like that? Well, maybe the predictions are the poll questions, right? So for any of you listeners who are not on the Discord, I would, like, urge you to join because it's a bunch of fun. But we also do this thing called HODT polls, House the Dragon polls, where we could ask, like, silly questions. And mostly they were predictions this time. So... We asked ourselves, will the show nettle will the show show nettles? And unfortunately, seven people said no. Two people no, seven people said no, two people said yes, and three were like fingers crossed. They better. Yeah. And then will Rhaenyra take King's Landing at the end of season two? Three no, four yes, and one angry shouting Homer Simpson grandpa. Um so they're they're all kind of future related. So maybe end on. Do you guys agree with those predictions? I didn't respond to that that poll question, but my I say yes, yes to both. So it will show nettles, and we will get to King's Landing. Wow, we're going to progress much faster than we have been in that case. <laughs> and per my participation in Dragon Cast a couple weeks ago, I really hope that show nettles is as badass and beautiful as our nettles. Aww. When I read the book now, yeah. I just put L in my head. Like whenever Nettles just is picture brought up, L, just picture L like L. flying yeah. through the air. Correct. <laughs> you guys looking fierce, looking fierce in the uh, air. Uh. <laughs> Hope springs eternal for Nettles, and as far as King's Landing goes, old man yells at Cloud. I think I they better show her either. They should they I better start her bleeding on the throne if that's the case. Oh, Last shot. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hope so. I, I if that happens, I hope we get that. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think if I was gonna respond to those polls, I'd use the boring emoji that we have. Like, one does not simply forget nettles. I'm kinda resigned that uh we won't get her. I've accepted it and I've gone through the grief, the denial. Nah, come on. But seriously, are we really uh, in the year of our Lord 2024 going to have HBO showrunners admit the only explicitly black character in the books? Surely the interwebs won't let them get away with that. Well, I'm just, I mean, I'm sorry, but, but she is pretty crucial. Like, she's yeah. she's not a footnote. I'm sorry. Like, at least that's not how I read it. Even in the world book. I've been moving be towards the idea to emagulate the that, uh, s- sorry, that Raina is going to be fulfilling Nettles' role, uh, given the Absolutely. setup that seems to be happening in her scenes. So I think that's how they'll say they 
covered their bases or whatever. Yep. I mean, while I while I'm all about more Bela, more Reyna, not like that though. Come on. Yeah, like all black women are interchangeable. You know. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that I would even be worse. We could just interchangeably like splice these characters together. Like fuck. Oh, yeah, you. because we cast a black actress for arguably a white role that we're gonna yeah omit. Like, come on now. That, that's not how it works. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be like borderline pissed off if they do that. Like, actually, I'm like really actual, pissed off. I'm yeah, actual people nuts pissed off. Like actual use of emoji appropriately pissed there off. There you go. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I always took yeah, Polly Walnuts to be like agreeing. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I took him to be like. Yeah, motherfuckers, I'm on your side. I'm fine. But anyway, like this is this just is just the emoji image. Not Sansa does not about. need to edit this this conversation <laughs> two hours into a podcast. Like, let's right. let the poor dude wrap this shit up. <laughs> We're gonna get there on. We're gonna get nettles. Stay tuned for more bitching about nettles next week and all the weeks right. to come. But to be clear, not bitching about our nettles. Then no, 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 never, never. I really think they should have hell to play nettles in the show. I'm not joking. Well, I do work from home, so you can add me. I'm not doing anything. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, HBO cast nettles. Come over to the Vassal Kings Grade Discord. Find nettles. We're here. What's up? Yeah. How do we reach out to the casting director and let them know? Slap my slap HBO. We got you. We got you. Michelle must stay. She works in TV. There we go. There we go. And with that, thank you all for being here today. And if you'd like to join the conversation, you can find us on the Vassals of Kings Grey Discord. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, Grinder. I ran out of yeah. I ran out of fun things to say. Grinder, Uber, um, <laughs> Aim Messenger. Uh, you know, all the good places. So thank you for my counselors for joining me again, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Love you. Thanks, Bye. Andrew. Love Bye-bye. you all. Bye, guys. Y'all take care. Who was the screaming grandpa from, Varley? No, that was for me. Oh, God. <laughs> That's a very Varley thing to do, so well done. Yeah, I was just going to say, you can assume at any point on any question, Varley is the angry screaming grandpa? Yes, absolutely. Or the Tolkien smoking pipe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although Varley's looking very svelte these days. I saw him recently and he's he's looking Yeah, he's looking he's looking good. Looking hot, Varley. Looking hot. Shout out to Varley, honorary member of Blackfires. Yeah, man. He needs to get on this. We should I'll I'll tell him next week. He needs to jump on. No, I the story behind that is I asked uh, Adam what the nerd rage emoji was on the server and Turns out we already had old man yelled at Cloud, which which fits perfectly. I love it. I didn't realize that was the Nerd Rage emoji. Emojis are tricky. That's though. I'm we, using it. <laughs> we have a we have a poorly walnuts emoji on the Vassals of Kingsgrove Discord that I I asked for because I love poorly walnuts. He's my favorite Sopranos character, and because I love him, whenever it's, I had a whole phase in COVID where if someone said something that I agreed with, I'd like do the poorly walnuts emoji. But in the emoji, he looks really angry and fierce. So people thought I was disagreeing. <laughs> That's true. I remember oh my God. that. Those I, I emojis like, don't three always fit. Periods. I had a whole like, three month period. Yeah. Right? In particular for Sarah, um, she was just like, and at some point on like a vocathon, it emerged that I had like, I was really offending people with my use of walnuts. <laughs> <laughs>
No, you know what's great? Because it was me and Sarah that were really just like, I don't know what the fuck this means, dude. But that was before I watched The Sopranos. But now that I've like, I'm like halfway through the show, I'm like, oh, no, no, I get it. Polly Walnuts, he's the best. Yeah, he's just the best. It's like having the... Yeah, so anyway, you've got to be careful with the emojis, I guess. It's, it's a VOC PSA for the day. 